Hey folks, welcome to Roll of Law. Today I want to talk about your world's calendar and how it can be used to add a lot of life to your campaign setting and how to minimize the amount of effort and cost that it takes to get there. Now in the real world, the calendar is really important. You need to know what days you're working, what days you're not working, as well as to manage your life around important days. Certainly those around you might be upset if you miss their birthdays, if you miss Valentine's Day, and things like that. The calendar kind of affects us in ways that you don't really think about, maybe until somebody sits down and makes a video about it. Now, in the game setting, there's all sorts of ways to, to run a calendar. And one of the easiest, and this is probably the most common, is just never to think about it. And theoretically, there's some sort of calendar, but there's never actually any special or important days. People just are always kind of in a state of everything is the same and you'll find this in lots of games and there's nothing wrong with it it's an easy way to do it it's low cost but you also don't get anything back from it because at that point you can't use it to sort of flesh out your setting at all so you'll see this typically in for instance video games almost always do this where you know days might be passing on in the setting but the shops are always open it's never sort of a festival day it's just always just today. So that is, again, perfectly acceptable. Lots of people prefer this because they don't want to have to manage this stuff. They don't want to, you know, it's a, they might think it's a distraction. They might feel it takes away from things. And certainly running a calendar that is more complicated than this does come with costs in terms of time and attention and so forth. So again, nothing wrong with this. It's perfectly acceptable. Now, another thing that you might get is real world calendars. And sometimes that's real world calendars with kind of the serial numbers filed off. But again, nothing wrong with this method. It is simple. It has a lot of advantages in terms of people's familiarity with it. So if you have a seven day week, for example, and you know, the months are the same months, then people already know this. They're already familiar with it. It, it just kind of meshes with them. And you might even have real world holidays. People are off celebrating Christmas or Easter or whatever else or Halloween. And at the same time, this can that this is easy and it's familiar to your players. It also has costs in terms of potentially detracting from your setting. So if you're playing a setting where you've got a bunch of different uh, sort of religious figures, deities, gods, you know, whatever they are, and you're running Christmas, the question is, why is, you know, your Thor analog, where does Christmas come from, right? These kinds of things can be a disconnect, which can in turn sort of take people out of the game and remind them that they're playing a game, which ideally is something you're not trying to do as you're playing these games. Now, if you want to get into a little bit more effort, you can you can do that. There's all sorts of ways to do this. I like the calendar builder that you can find on kanka.io. Um, I'll drop a link to that. Um, they're not a sponsor. It's nothing like that. It's just they have a decent one and I've used it in the past. Now, keep in mind as you do this, a number of assumptions because it's really easy to get yourself into a place where you've built a calendar that no one likes. And everything that you change from the real world calendar has a cost. So certain changes end up being more impactful than others. So some of these might be how many days in a week. People typically in sort of the Western world expect a seven day week. And if it's not a seven day week, they might say, well, what's going on? Uh, they might get a little confused. However, uh, it's quite common in fantasy settings to change that up to a 10 day week. And just one thing I will very strongly recommend is to keep your weeks regular. So you shouldn't have, or at least the costs I think exceed the benefit. If you, for instance, have alternating five and nine day weeks, at that point, the calculation becomes a bit of a burden and that's annoying. Length of month is also something to think about. Um, in the real world, we have months of different lengths and that's a great way to do it, but often people try to simplify or do simplify because you do get that benefit by, for instance, setting every month to a fixed number. You know, every month has 30 days. Cool. Or every month has 40 days, which is four weeks of 10 days. 
perfectly acceptable, nothing wrong with that. I personally like to sort of mix it up, but that doesn't mean you, you can't try different things. And I do recommend trying different things. Now, once we've got that idea, you can plug that in. And I typically, when I start thinking about what else to put into my calendar, I look to my campaign settings, religious figures, because that is going to drive a lot of um, sort of how people act and what they do. Now, if you look online, you'll find articles suggesting that medieval peasants had about as many days off or more days off. Sometimes they'll suggest that people had, in fact, like half the year off uh, than modern people do. Now, I'm going to say that, you know, the days off thing is probably overblown. And this is worthwhile when we start thinking about what a festival day looks like. Because your average medieval peasant doesn't really get a day off. All of the things that need to be done in order to keep their household going still have to be done. So if you have a flock of chickens and it's a day off, you still got to feed the chickens because the chickens don't recognize whatever holiday you're on. So the average peasant, even when they get a day off, is still going to have a number of chores and a number of tasks. But what that holiday looks like might in fact be quite different based on social strata. And that's always worth thinking about as we start deciding what we're going to do with these things. So I've got my calendar, and this is the calendar that I use for a campaign setting that I play quite a lot. And I'll just bring that up so that you guys can see it. And it's got different months, and the different months are basically a reference to different religious figures in the setting. So you've got, you know, the, the month of anvils, you've got the month of bulls, uh, the month of scales. Each of these is actually a reference to a god. So bulls refers to Elok, who is the god of charity and sort of compassion. And scales refers to the god of justice in the setting. So at this point, I'm already baking in some setting details into these uh, sort of calendar aspects. Now, the uh, it also lets you set up things with moons. So you can have, you know, lunar cycles. This might be important if you want to say, hey, it's a full moon. I'm going to throw some werewolves at them. Now you know when the full moon is. And the players might know this too, right? So that it's not just like, hey guys, it's the full moon all of a sudden because it's plot relevant. That makes the world feel more real. They were expecting the full moon instead of it just being a thing that you just kind of declared out of nowhere, which might, uh, might not have the same feeling. So the first thing I like to do when I've got this, and I went with seven day weeks, I went with uh, sort of uh, staggered month lengths, but when I'm sort of looking at my budget of about half or a little less than half of the year in festival or rest days or sort of special days, the first thing I do, I'm going to do is I spent all of that or a fair chunk of it uh, rather in just a rest day. So every week there's a day that is sort of a rest day. And every time that happens, I'm, I can describe the world a little bit differently. The shops are closed up. A lot of people just aren't, you know, working. They're not selling things. They're instead enjoying some leisure time. So now I've got something that happens on a regular basis where things are going to be a little bit different. And then I can start plugging in festivals. And I'm going to start thinking about these things in terms of a variety of different cultural influences. And so one of the first ones I already mentioned is going to be religious. What are different gods' festivals and where do they make sense, right? So if you've got a uh, an agriculture god, there's probably a harvest festival that you're going to have at some point. A harvest festival is just a good idea in general. And so you can plug that in in sort of the uh, the autumn time. And now you can start to flesh that out. What does that look like? What is your god of harvest and what do they do? So uh, when we look at sort of religious festivals, I've got this one here, which is uh, Elok's Feast. And I can just bring that up here just to describe what it is. Um, donations of food are collected and prepared into a massive meal at each temple of Elok. Now, again, Elok is a god of charity and looking out for the poor and this sort of thing. You know, I'm not going to go into full detail here because... The video is about calendars, but uh, smaller temples or smaller towns without a temple may just do this at town halls or perhaps in a festival square, where whatever they've got. The, uh, 
The guiding rule at these meals is those who are last eat first, i.e. people are expected to go in order of the most impoverished or desperate on to those who are least impoverished or desperate. So it's kind of a show of humility for the rich and powerful to attend and sit there hungry as everyone else is eating. And in theory, they should be either attending and eating or else fasting that evening. That's sort of the observance. Uh, for some of them, uh, for some nobles, it means that they make sure that the temples are well provisioned. Because if you still want to have a nice dinner out of this, you better make sure that all of the people who are eating in front of you also are having a nice dinner and that there's more than enough so that you've got stuff left. Um, but again, because I sort of boil in some of the conflicts that you get between people who have money and power and people who don't, um, some other people just quietly eat at home and ignore the festival. So that's, now I've got a, a festival, it's a feast day. We've got sort of a feeling of about that. We've got a feeling of what that is like. And I've directly tied it into one of the major uh, religious uh, structures in my, in my game. And so when that comes up, I can, I get this sort of payoff in the sense that now we can, this is a day when all sorts of things can happen. Uh, it can have all sorts of cultural implications, but it also reinforces this setting as a living and breathing world where things are happening and things are happening that maybe aren't about the players. Um, if they come back from an adventure and it's this feast day, well, that isn't something they did. That isn't something they caused. It's just something that exists in the world beyond them. I'm also going to think about uh, cultural uh, festivals. And so as an example of that, I have First Stone and Hearth Forging, both of which are basically uh, religious or not so much religious as cultural uh, festivals that are based around different uh, species within my game. So First Stone is a celebration of Dwarven culture. And basically it started out with dwarves and it includes things like drinking strong, strong drink, telling of ancient dwarven legends, throwing hammers, this kind of thing. But it's not limited to dwarves anymore in the same way that you might think of like St. Patrick's Day, not just being limited to the Irish. Lots of people enjoy, you know, enjoy celebrating it. Um, hearth forging is a halfling festival and so it is based around a different kind of idea because basically the way you celebrate that one is you give three gifts to the one is to your home one is to the homes of your neighbors and that that second gift might actually be multiple gifts and then the third one is a gift to a uh, the home of a treasured friend now part of this is that these are actually gifts not for the person but for the home. It's supposed to be something that makes the home a nicer place to live. So uh, as an example, giving somebody a new bathtub improves their home and it's a, you know, or if you go and give them like a new pot or something like that, but if you give them a ring or a bracelet, maybe not so much. You can also take real world festivals and kind of file the serial numbers off and make them a little bit different. And I've done that in mine with a few different things. There's uh, the Night of Secrets, where people are going around wearing masks, having different parties. Um, you can sort of see how that might be going. Uh, there's the Miracles, which is a, a little bit more than a week-long holiday. People take time off. People decorate their houses with reflective baubles. And typically, at the end of it, there is some gift-giving. Maybe sounds a little familiar, right? But... Um, it's at the same time, it's not explicitly a real world holiday. Uh, so all of these things are things that uh, allow for me to create different things. Uh, if we've got a festival where people go around in public wearing masks, well, now I can think, you know, what are people going to do with that? Are people going to, you know, might this be a great time for somebody to run an assassination or something like that, where I can start integrating all of this? Another thing you can do with festivals is actually make them magical. Uh, if you've read, uh, for instance, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you know that when Christmas comes along, people do actually get, get gifts. You know, the main characters are given gifts, and they're, they're sort of magical gifts. Well, 
you can do that. You can throw in things like that. I've got a holiday call I call Fae Gifting, which is a holiday where literally it, people say that the Fae give gifts to mortals. Um, however, typically that's not actually the Fae doing it. Typically that's parents giving gifts or um, gifts in, given in this way are typically said to be, uh, you're supposed to do it anonymously. And in fact, specifying who it's from is considered a little bit crass. Um, but you might, for instance, just get a gift for your neighbors and leave it packaged in a, a sort of nondescript packaging and just leave it on their porch. So anonymous gifts. But here's the fun thing is that most of the gifts given in Fey gifting are just people doing it, but not all of them. And so this is a holiday where I can certainly have the players receive something from actual fey creatures and going, what's this about? Um, these are sort of circumstances that uh, allow me to do all sorts of fun things. Other things to think about in terms of festivals, options that you might want to consider. Um, each kingdom probably has some sort of celebrations of itself. So that's a very common thing, some sort of nationalistic celebration. Um, those, that's one option. You, as I mentioned before, another option is holidays from our own experiences. I also sort of encourage considering holidays that might, for instance, involve upsetting the typical social orders. So you might want to think about including a holiday, for instance, where uh, the rich, you know, people with servants, instead serve their servants and their servants, you know, get to play at being, you know, lords. These kinds of inversions are very common in real world festivals and real world celebrations. And so that gives you another option. Uh, you can also have festivals where perhaps uh, ordinary social uh, mores and social obligations and restrictions are lifted in various ways. So for instance, you know, in the real world, a lot of our sort of festival days involve drinking in maybe at times and in places and so forth or to amounts that we might otherwise consider to be improper. Um, you know, if you're drinking at 10 a.m. on a work day, people might say, hey, that's that's not cool. But if you're drinking at 10 a.m. on a holiday that is based around drinking, people don't tend to judge as much. Uh, so as an example of this, in my setting, there is the Lost Gods Day. And what that's about is that there's various uh, deities that are normally considered um, off limits for worship. They're evil deities. One of them, for example, is a god of disease and putrescence and rot. Um, that particular god would like nothing more than to see all of people. Um, you know, it's like, hey, you're great now, but wouldn't you be better as kind of a rotting, festering zombie going around spreading further disease? Which is not something you really want worshipped in your campaign setting, right? This is something that people consider evil. But on the Lost Gods Day, it's allowable to um, to engage in some worship of these deities, to leave out, you know, to construct small shrines to them. And typically, this is celebrated by constructing these shrines in ways that uh, basically you're asking these gods to just not hurt you. Like, this is the appropriate day for that. Now, there are social aspects to this. If you go and you have a big celebration about how much you like this god on that day, and it's not just sort of like, hey, please leave us alone, your neighbors might judge you. But on this particular day, there is no punishment to it. So this is another example of a situation where we can have uh, a religious observance, a religious festival, and it kind of breaks things up. But we can also... Um, we can also imagine how this is going to affect our setting. Now, you might be saying, isn't this a lot of work? Well, it does take a bit of work to construct your calendar, but it doesn't take as much as you might think. I built what I think is a pretty good calendar. Um, I'm, I've used it quite successfully in a number of different games, um, and it took me about a day or two. So not, not nothing, certainly but not a huge uh, time impact. But you want to minimize the amount that, of mental effort that this puts on your players. And there's various ways to do that. One is I like to print out a calendar and make sure that people have access to it. 
On some occasions, I have gone so far as to have a calendar printed, like an actual calendar, and then put it up on the wall while I'm running a game. And so people can actually see what the day is. They can see the festival days. You don't need to go that far, but it can help. Uh, but certainly giving them a printout where they've got all of this or giving them access so they can see it online is definitely going to be helpful. But the other thing is that you can start sort of boiling this into your NPC interactions. So when somebody is at the bar and they're doing the typical we are adventurers, we're at the bar, we're, you know, doing whatever, you can certainly have the bartender mention something like, oh yes, uh, in three days we've got us, you know, we're going to have 10% off for this particular festival. So when you're doing your drinking for this festival, we want you to do it here. And you can have, uh, you know, as mentioned, when you've got your rest day, you can have stores closed up. Um, that may be a minor inconvenience to your players, but a rogue, for instance, might think that's a great time to go stealing things. And they're probably not wrong. But... Uh, this also helps create that feeling of things actually sort of happening. Um, and you don't even necessarily need to make a big deal of it so much as just things happen. Um, if there's a festival that involves sort of marching and celebrating in the streets, you can just have that happening as things are going on. Um, I recommend not playing a lot of gotcha on this one. And what I mean by that is that most of these holidays, if players ignore them, or just aren't keeping up on them. I don't tend to make a lot of holidays that will feel like, um, where the players will feel like they have uh, violated some sort of social cue or obligation. So I don't typically have it where people are going to be angry at them in the same way that, for instance, your spouse might be really upset if you didn't get them anything for Christmas or for Valentine's Day or various other things, right? Um, so if you're going to do that, you really need to give people a lot of warnings, you know, that they might have a social obligation or expectation. But uh, be careful with that, because that's how you can turn this into uh, potential hurt feelings. If players feel like they've had this uh, sprung on them and that it wasn't really a fair thing, then they'll start to dislike this. And then they dislike your calendar and they dislike engaging with your world in this way. So... Yeah. Now you might be wondering, because I've already got a contest going about win Gimlet's Gold, um, if there's a clue in this. And I can tell you, this video is a clue. So hopefully that's going to help you out. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, I am giving away 10 silver one ounce coins, real coins. And I'll link that video uh, here so that you can track that down and find it. But uh, I'm hoping that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking out for a winner. So um, that'll probably take a while because there's going to be more clues necessary, I think, before anyone can solve it. But uh, check that out. So these, uh, I really like using a calendar. It's something that I think is, uh, is beneficial. It's something that I try to do when I'm making a, a campaign. But again, if you just want to have the sort of no calendar method or the real world method or any of these things, that's perfectly okay too. And there are people who prefer those things. I just find that uh, when I'm running a game, it's fairly low cost to me. It's one of those things that doesn't take a lot of my attention away because I can just kind of glance at the calendar and tick days off. You know, if, if the players spend three days traveling, I just mark off three days and now I know where we are but it can really help in terms of these sorts of moments. And sometimes when I don't have any other ideas for an adventure, it might actually literally be that my next adventure plan comes up because I look at one of these things, you know, at one of the holidays and go, oh, right, that's coming up. I'm going to do something for that. And so the next time players are engaged in some sort of action and adventure is something that is based around that holiday. So that, I think, can be a lot of fun as well. So anyway, let me know in the comments below what you think. Um, is there a method you prefer? Have you tried this and had successes? And also, have you tried this and had failures? Because sometimes the things that go wrong teach us as much or more 
as the things that go really well. So I love hearing all of that. Please let me know in the comments below. It, of course, helps this channel. Uh, please like this video, share it with others, uh, subscribe if you thought this was useful and you want to see more of this. Anyway, um, those are just some thoughts on that. Again, I really think that this is something that kind of ups your game and can take it from just kind of an ordinary game to one where people are really invested in your world and where they really want to see what's going to happen next. So that's something I always want in a game. And uh, yeah, so let me know again uh, what your thoughts are. And until then, see you next time.